Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented on our site. We do not endorse any we do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate for any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now I'm going to turn over the introductions of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the program coordinator of NJCTS. Marty. Kelly, thank you, and welcome to everyone who's joined us for tonight's webinar. Our presenter is Dr. Brian Chu, a New Jersey native who received his undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania and his PhD from Temple University. He is assistant professor in both the Department of Clinical Psychology at the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology and in the Department of Psychology at Rutgers University. He is director and founder of the Youth Anxiety and Depression Clinic, which is a university-based research clinic that provides evidence-based assessment and treatment for children and adolescents. His expertise includes assessment, treatment, and dissemination of evidence-based treatment to schools and community clinics. Dr. Chu also has an interest in understanding multicultural issues that impact help seeking behavior and access to mental health services. In addition to writing journal articles and book chapters on these topics, he has co-authored two treatment manuals, Cognitive Behavioral Family Therapy for Anxious Children and Behavioral Activation and Social Exposure Group Treatment for Schizophrenia and Other Serious Mental Illness. Dr. Chu applies the scientist practitioner model through his research, his supervision of graduate students, and the courses he teaches in child psychopathology and cognitive behavior therapy for anxiety and depression. It's with great pleasure that I turn tonight's program over to Dr. Chu. Uh, thank you, uh, Marty and uh, Kelly, for helping set all this up and for um, inviting me. Uh, I'm looking very much uh, forward to uh, presenting, and this is um, truth be told, my first webinar, and I think this is just a fantastic um, mode to uh, reach out to people and get um, diverse groups of people together. I'm um, just looking at the pre-registration um, numbers. It looks like there's just about equal numbers of both parents and uh, school personnel, and I think that the, the chances that you get to get that group to, together is fantastic um, and rare. And it's particularly important for this particular topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is school refusal, um, particularly as it relates to anxiety and distress. And um, I'm just excited to be able to talk to this group because this is the type of um, collaboration that we need in order to address this problem. Um, first, as a introduction, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with a uh, moving this one. Um, as Marty mentioned, I am an assistant professor over at the uh, Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology, and our clinic there is the Youth Anxiety Depression Clinic, where we do see um, youth anywhere between the ages of 8 and 16 presenting with a primary problem of anxiety or depression, um, providing them any sort of uh, or uh, comprehensive diagnostic assessments and goal-directed cognitive behavioral therapy. I provide some information so that if you have any additional questions or um, interest in this afterwards or um, uh, have any sort of need for ongoing collaboration, uh, please feel free to contact us. Um, I'm aware that um, uh, some of you may be calling or listening in from New Jersey, but not all. And so um, in terms of recommendations and finding um, something uh, similar in terms of services, what I would do is recommend looking uh, specifically for things, uh, for clinics or services that do refer to cognitive or cognitive behavioral programs because the kind of services that we're going to be talking about today um, you know, won't be able to be duplicated by other more generalist approaches. Um, and um, also you should know that uh, my specialty is generally in anxiety disorders in, in general and mood problems, but not specifically Tourette syndrome. Um, and we do have a kind of sister program here that does focus on um, Tourette uh, uh, um, syndrome programs, and I do recommend I know that we would work in collaboration if we had a child with both anxiety and uh, Tourette. So that's just an introduction. When we talk about school refusal, 
Well, how do we define it? Well, the basic definition is child-motivated refusal to attend school, difficulties remaining in class for the entire day, or both. Um, it also has to be associated with some significant impairment, either in the number of days missed um, impact on the school uh, grade performance, interpersonal arguments either with the family or with their peers or friends, or some sort of concrete con um, consequences. Um, you might start to see legal action being taken because of the um, absence of the school. Um, for the, the professionals amongst us, you should know that it's not a formal um, diagnostic psychological um, diagnosis, um, but that it is a behavior associated with a number of psychological problems. Um, it's hard to, in fact, get a handle on how big of a problem this is just simply because of this definitional um, problems that we see here. If you look at national data, I guess the place you would start is just looking at basic absences because we're talking about um, children being absent from school. And for daily reported numbers, we'd be seeing about 5.5% of the population not being in school and about 20% of those absences reported as being problematic school refusal. These often don't count other types of problems that could fall into the rubric of school refusal, like um, cutting classes or tardiness, or duress during the day where uh, students are really distressed, distracted, having difficulty paying attention to classes, and are seeking um, reassurance or looking for ways to get out of class like going to the to nurse's office. So one could uh, place the best overall estimate for school-related refusal-related problems at anywhere between 5 and 28 percent on a given day. And what we seem to know is that these rates increase in the inner cities, public schools, impoverished schools, where the resources um, are less and where the attention on, on each kid might be less than another school. Uh, where do we, how do we usually see school refusal present itself? Well, we often can see it throughout the entire day in various forms. So you might begin to see a child um, start to feign sickness the night before, start to put up resistance going to bed. You might have a child who protests or get, um, refuses to get up in the morning, get out of bed, drags themselves through the morning routine, or has difficulty getting into the car or refuses to get onto the bus. Um, once they get into school, if they can get into school, then you might see them um, repeatedly ask um, to leave the classroom in order to go to the nurse's office or go to the attendant's office or go try to call home to try to be picked up. Um, and it's often predicted or precipitated by events at school that might increase uh, the child's anxiety, like either knowing that they're going to be in class with certain kids they don't get along with, or particular tests or um, um, difficult uh, activities during uh, the day. We seem to find that the greatest risk, as you'd expect for school refusal behavior, or at least significant school refusal, to come during major transition periods, like kindergarten, um, or moving from elementary school to middle school, or going into high school. Um, the later that we see the first time the school refusal uh, onsets, the more severe we'd expect the, absent, um, the absenteeism. What we're finding is that um, school refusal happens equally in boys and girls. Um, and that it seems to come with the increased presence of anxiety, depression, and other psychological or behavioral problems, in addition to medical illnesses like asthma or um, problems with enuresis, for example, if a child's having difficulties with bladder control. Um, what is interesting is that it equally affects um, children of across all intelligence levels and all academic achievement levels. So we're not just talking about kids who are either struggling in school or having difficulties or placed in special classes or the opposite, where um, we're talking about kids who are under a, lot, a great deal of pressure um, and high achievers. So it seems to affect kids across the academic and cognitive ability level. What we do know is that in the short term, um, significant school refusal, and what we're talking about is school refusal that seems to last beyond two weeks. So the first two weeks are pretty critical. If it's a fleeting um, delay, tardiness, or absenteeism during, um, say, the beginning of a school year or after the holidays, and yet within four or five days, even up to a week, that they're able to get back in themselves, that may not be, have much long-term consequences. But if we're talking about staying out 10 days, 11 days, 12 days, up to two weeks and beyond, then we're talking about the potential for um, a real school refusal that we should attend to. And that would come, as you'd expect, with a high degree of child distress, family conflict, certainly disruption of the routine, making it difficult for parents to get to work, 
And then it has a big impact, an increasing impact on the child with the ability to uh, stay up with uh, classes, um, homework, um, their grades start uh, to decrease, uh, social alienation as they're no longer seeing their, their friends and, and classmates are starting to ask, where are you? What's going on? And depending on how strict the uh, uh, school is, uh, it can result in legal trouble in terms of um, fines that the school levies on the parents and families. Um, and um, and it, as the uh, conflict escalates, it can lead to child maltreatment and abuse as well. Unfortunately, the long-term consequences don't get much better either. Even for those who um, get treated, but unsuccessfully so, we would see continued family conflict, uh, significant psychological and violence problems down the road. And then, as you would expect, unstable job histories, unemployment, school dropout, leaving home early or early marriage, having their own marital problems, and even themselves having children with truancy later on. So. Clearly, both the short-term and the long-term consequences are something that we want to pay attention to. Um, and uh, it uh, reminds us that school refusal is something to take very seriously. Now, how do we understand school refusal? Um, well, Chris Kearney, who is the uh, really the leader in the field um, for understanding and developing treatments for school refusal, has devised a system in which we look at the function of school refusal. That is, you know, what what are the things that maintain the child's behavior? What motivates a child to refuse school? And we should put motivates in quotes um, because we're not talking most of the time um, that the reason that the child is refusing school um, to be some sort of manipulative or conscious um, action in order to get something that they want, but rather that these are emotional issues that are prompting the desire to avoid school at high cost. And so one of the largest um, uh, reasons that uh, kids tend to avoid school is simply because of the, of they want to avoid negative affect. And when we talk about negative affect, we're talking about that intense but diffuse emotional and psychological um, distress and pain that kids might feel that they can't quite label. It's not like a specific fear like when you see a spider, but just um, you'd see this in, in high worriers or um, kids who are depressed. and they can't necessarily identify a single um, uh, trigger at school that really bothers them, but they just know that when they get there, they feel this overwhelming stress that they can't seem to handle it, they don't know what's going to happen, and that whatever the day brings, it can only get worse as the day goes along. And this seems to explain in, a num in, in, in large com um, kind of assessments with uh, children who have school refusal, that it seems to affect a large number of these kids are, are attributing the refusal to negative affect. There are those kids who have specific fears of social evaluation, worrying about what the other kids or what the teachers are going to think about them. Um, there are those kids who are um, um, seeking um, uh, attention um, and or intangible rewards, such as being at home, um, uh, getting uh, comfort or um, reassurance from parents or other people um, from being at home. And so it's more of a safe environment for them to be at home. And these often paired with the avoidance of negative affect as well. And then there are those kids who are pursuing tangible rewards. So when they do skip school or classes, they get something out of it by being at home, either because they um, uh, simply uh, get to avoid schoolwork or homework and or the home environment is very enriching. Um, these are often more the kids that are, um, you know, might fall into the, uh, the uh, domain of delinquency. And so we actually don't um, address this problem as much. Most of the kids that we see, um, at our clinic, and, and the ones that are coming as related to anxiety are uh, from the top three um, uh, functions. And so it's the fact that they can't quite identify it, but they're feeling a huge amount of distress and can't explain it, but just can't imagine themselves getting to school. So how do we address that? Um, well, first, we think about what role each person in the, in the system might play. And when we're talking about the children, first we want to help them understand um, how anxiety plays out and how the different components of, it, of that emotion um, really influence each other. So the thoughts, the physical feelings, and actions. So when we're talking about school refusal, what we seem to find and what we try to explain to the children is that school refusal comes along with a number of distinct physical feelings, the stomach aches, the sickness, the feelings of panic, thinking that they're going to go crazy or feeling like they're going to be out of control if they, the more that they think about school or the closer that they get to school. And of course, this all contributes to a number of sleep disturbances throughout the uh, um, evenings and, uh, at the, uh, as it, uh, the week goes on. 
what's also associated with uh, school refusal are uh, pretty distinctive thoughts, um, either centered around school per se or their ability to handle school. So either school's too hard, the kids and teachers are mean to me, um, but also just simply I can't handle it. Even when I get there and it's going to be distressing, I won't know what to do. Um, they can also have um, specific fears of being, being away from the parents or worrying something will happen to them. Um, and then we get those kids who also be, um, begin to, because of their fear is uncontrollable, start to have this depressive um, uh, uh, kind of feel to them and begin to just take on this um, apathetic uh, approach of I don't care. And when you're thinking that way, uh, it, this naturally leads to a lot of avoidance and escape of behavior that produces the resistance, the delaying, the refusal, um, and the fighting with the parents and school personnel that we would see. Um, you might see actual physical panic attacks, um, but you certainly see a lot of begging, reassurance seeking, and then the actual physical resistance. And what we try to explain to kids is that you know each of these components make up this feeling of distress that you feel as you're thinking about going to school or approaching school. And that what we and what they we want to do is we can intervene in any one of these components because as you imagine that. Each of these affect each other. And so as you're concentrating on your stomach aches, your sickness, your panic feelings, that might make you want to kind of close down, shut down, withdraw, resist, because you think, I can't, I can't handle it. That influences your thoughts. Like, I'm going to have a panic attack as soon as I get close to that school. Well, if you're thinking, I'm going to have a panic attack, the closer you get to school, your stomach is going to tighten more, and you're going to feel more sick, and then that's going to make you resist more. So these are all uh, interrelated, and they they feed into each other into a downward spiral. So we help the child realize that once you start in on one of these components, it's going to start spiraling down so they get uh, more and more distressed um, the longer that you stay in this cycle. And so what we want to do is try to um, provide um, interventions that can intervene at any one of those parts of the cycle. We also want to explain the basic physiology of distress. And this is something that kids don't often understand, and a lot of parents don't um, get, is that what we know about distress, anxiety, fear, is that the body is not meant to be um, unendingly stressed forever. Uh, we use this, um, uh, this figure, the habituation curve, to explain this. And this goes by many different names. It can be called the worry hill. It can be called the fear curve. And what the point of, of it is is to explain that over time, um, no matter what happens, when you have a stressor, your body is meant to react to it. And so let's say you're going to school. Your body is meant to get um, distressed, upset, fearful if you have had bad experiences at school. But over time, whereas most kids believe that it's going to skyrocket and the fear will continue unabated, what we know is that the body was not meant to have unending distress and that it has uh, physiological controls to bring it back down to normal over time. But what happens is that most kids and uh, most people, when they are facing something stressful, they might be feeling the escalation, 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 um, and then they do something that feels very natural and instinctual, which is to escape. So they leave, and what happens but their stress drops. And so it makes total sense that they would then learn that, ah, it, it, it's very successful to escape the situation. But what they don't learn is that over time, it would have just gotten better over time. And so what we, we want to teach them is that if you stick through it and get over that hump, things will get better. And then we also teach them some basic skills, um, like that emotions education, some relaxation skill, problem solving, how to identify their negative thinking, and, and how to come up with um, coping thoughts, and then also um, real life, imaginal or in vivo exposure tests where we give them practice at doing the things that are really tricky for them. Okay. What do we expect from the parents? Well, what we try to convey is that parents do have a role in this. We don't you know, lay the responsibility on the parents, but we do say that the parents have a role in how they respond to the children so that we can either encourage attendance or maintain the, um, the school refusal. And what we want to do is, is teach them that part of that is to um, uh, reinforce any positive behaviors that we see in the child. Those are going to be the approach behaviors going to school. We're going to want to ignore the unwanted behaviors. These are the things like complaining, reassurance, seeking, crying, whining, physical complaints. And we also will have some uh, pre-planned consequences for things if they are not complying with expect, um, expectations. We develop the reward chart and assign rewards collaboratively with the parent and the child. 
so that um, th these are meaningful rewards that the child can look forward to, acknowledging that this will be difficult. Um, you know, you're listening to your body. You seem upset when you go to school. That makes sense. We're not dismissing that. And so we're going to acknowledge the efforts that you make to get to school. We plan a gradual hierarchy together. But, and by hierarchy, it just means a list of graded challenges ranked from easier to harder so that we're moving them um, uh, 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 towards greater and greater competence and confidence, um, rewarding them along the way. And the goals are to reduce the child's dependence on the parents and increase their own confidence. How do we help parents start to understand their role in this process? Well, we look at a basic kind of sequence of events of helping them identify the antecedents or triggers um, and then uh, what happens with the child's behavior and then the consequences. So one example might be something like looking at what happens, um, how could a parent potentially trigger some refusal. Well, a parent might criticize a child for something that they weren't doing. They didn't do their homework or they got a bad grade. The child feels discouraged, and so they refuse to come out of the room. This might be looking for some sort of trigger or antecedent that might lead to the child's um, school refusal. Another possibility is that um, the child might complain and feel sick, um, come to the parent and say, I can't go to school. The parent lets them stay home, and the child gets sick more. And this is a simple example of looking for maintaining factors. Um, and so we use simple examples like this just to get the parent thinking, oh, are there any things that we do that might trigger or maintain some of these behaviors? And we're very careful to um, explain right from the get-go that we are not here to blame the parents for this. We understand that the kids are coming to the table with their own stuff. They come upset. There's, there's very few parents out there who would say, oh, I want to make my kids um, stay home from school. That's not what we're looking for. The kids come already upset. They, they, they come um, primed for, uh, for being sensitive if things are going on in school, but that there are ways that parents can respond that either encourage or uh, uh, encourage school attendance or could maintain some of that refusal. We, we send them home with a tracker so that they can identify their child anxious behavior, how they might respond, and then how the child responds to them. So for example, one example, waking up for school. Well, the child says that they, um, they're they sick and he starts to cry and she locks herself in her room. You might respond, I feel bad. I'm rushed to get to work, so I just have to leave them there and, and let them stay home. The child seems relieved, goes back to sleep. Um, and in that case, uh, the parent might be unintentionally reinforcing avoidance, part out of practicality. I just have to get to work. But they're um, uh, uh, letting the child know that it's okay if they put up enough of a protest, they might say. The child might themselves might reinforce the parents by saying, oh, thank you so much for letting me stay. You're the best mom ever. And that just reinforces that avoidance. Um, another possibility um, that we're looking for um, at, at school, like if um, the teacher asks the, um, the child to answer a question on the blackboard, the child keeps his head down, freezes, or mumbles, the teacher might say something like, well, let's just move on to someone else. Um, or they might get somewhat semi-critical, are you not prepared again? And then the child shrinks lower, freezes. Again, in the first example, um, what we might be unintentionally doing is, again, reinforcing the avoidance. Well, if you just keep your head down, if you don't respond, then you're, um, you, know, you can get away with not answering the question um, and or discouraging attempts also because many times we don't know what to do. So we just try to kind of give ourselves ways to start to identify how, what are ways that we're participating in that process. And what we try to um, convert families and schools um, both to do is to adopt um, a different kind of general approach and mentality and attitude towards how to deal with a kid. Um, parents are often always frustrated, I don't know what to do. Um, it gets into a huge negotiation and an argument. And we uh, remind parents to just um, not getting engaged in the argument to begin with. And we use a very simple cliche that uh, exemplifies our approach, which is empathize and encourage, which is simply to do two parts that help set a different tone for how what our expectations are for the, for the child. So first, when a child's really upset, they wake up in the morning, they don't feel like they can go, the first thing we recommend parents to do is definitely listen to them. We don't want to just ignore them or neglect them or seem like we're banning them, but we do want to say, I know it sounds like you're, you're really upset, or even take out the sounds like that can sometimes sound fake, but I know that this is really hard for you, or I know you're really worried about going to school, but I know you can do it. Demonstrating a very calm, accepting attitude towards a child, giving him a stiff hand in the back, lower back, and saying, listen, this is hard, and you can do it. 
And although this sounds simple, it's something that's really difficult and takes a lot of practice because um, the child themselves have already kind of, and the parents themselves have gotten into a routine where if the child just fights hard enough, the parents just end up giving in because it's too much of a battle and so it's hard to do. So we have to kind of shift and say, listen, I know this is really difficult. I'm demonstrating that I'm here. I'm listening to you. But you really just have to go. Um, and then in the context of a whole plan, this is the, uh, the new attitude that we're going to be encouraging parents to take on. And we're going to be teaching the school to do it as well. The big important thing is to resist temptations to pacify or give easy reassurance to the ch um, to children and to not problem solve for the child. Rather, we're going to be putting the, um, the power back into the child and saying, what can you do to help yourself get up and go to school now? Okay. Uh, so again, the cliche that we're going to come back to over and over is using a new attitude, empathize, but encourage. Uh, our example is, I know you're nervous, but I know you can do it. How do we start with then working with the schools with this? Well, what we want to do is um, some pragmatic things, which is first we want to identify a liaison school, someone who um, is at the school and has direct contact with the kid or who has been um, identified already as having a good relationship with them. That can be a school um, counselor. It can be uh, a teacher. It could be a coach. It could uh, even be an attendance officer, someone who sees this kid a lot. Um, we want to arrange a family and school joint meeting, both with and without the child. We want to agree on the goals. And for us, the goal is always to get the child back into school as soon as possible. Um, that, that's our priority because um, for us, um, there are too many opportunities that are being missed if the child is out of school, um, both social, academic, um, personal. So that's the place where children need to be. Um, and it sends the message that things can be tough, but you can do them, but we need you to go and try. And not that when things are tough, well, maybe you need a break and maybe you need to stay home. Um, we want to make sure that we avoid those kinds of messages. Uh, so we agree on those goals, but we also have to agree on a timeline. So for example, if a child has been out of school for an entire half a year or a year, we might not expect them to get back every day, full days, but agree with, okay, in the, in the first, over the course of four weeks, we expect this. Over the course of eight weeks, we expect that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, know the resources and limits that the school is willing to offer. Um, for example, uh, you know, does the school have very strict limits if they're over already um, fighting up against that 20-day limit? Are they um, giving permission to kind of um, uh, give you some leeway on that? Uh, do half days count? Um, even when there, would, would the school allow the kid to have a pass to go to the nurse's office for some days um, so that we can um, kind of in a graded fashion remove the supports gradually? Um, and then you agree with the child, parent, and school their role. Um, we want to break um, the goals into small steps. We do collective problem solving. And then we establish rewards both inside and outside the school and also the uh, establish the consequences that are meaningful and fair. Um, just want to speed a little bit along since I think I'm running behind. Um, people always ask, what are accommodations that are reasonable? And this, of course, depends on the situation, depending on what the child's uh, natural abilities are, what their um, academic um, uh, uh, achievements have been up to that point, um, but also just looking at ways to make sure that they're in school, and that's the most important thing, even if they're not uh, completing all of their work, because the, uh, the sooner you can get them on school property, um, the, uh, the, the easier the rest of it's going to come. So we could um, agree to modified assessment assignments, um, testing in private or quiet places, um, we want to uh, certainly educate uh, the teacher or teachers about the child's anxiety and suggest strategies to help the child um, cope, um, uh, uh, possibly uh, identifying a safe adult at school so when they are having difficulties, they can go to that person. Um, and um, in general, we want to teach the school to also respond to the child in the same way, knowing that, oh, you know what, we know this is difficult for you. We appreciate that you're here, but we know that you can probably stick it through, so do the best you can. Um, we, it's helpful to really identify um, each person's role, the child, the parent, and the school um, throughout the entire day so that people know what to expect. Uh, so with the children in the morning, we would expect, listen, whatever it takes, just drag yourself out of bed. Um, you know, we'll give you whatever rewards it, it needs to in order to get yourself out, whether it means like, um, you know, uh, TiVoing your favorite TV and watching it um, in the morning time in order to get yourself out. But that's your responsibility. Get yourself out of bed. The parent's role is is to um, be there at the morning um, if they need to wake up the kid. 
Um, but uh, be there to use that empathize and encourage right away. I know this is the worst time of day, but you've got to get up. And I know you can do it. Um, and also, even though um, you know, we don't encourage uh, our parents to uh, become negative or personal and to use um, shame or, or, or blame with the, the kids, um, we don't find that that helpful to you know, put the child down or say, you know, you're never going to make it or you're going to, um, you know, uh, if you keep doing this, you're going to never graduate and you'll amount to nothing. That kind of um, encouragement um, usually leads to um, more negative long-term effects. But that doesn't mean that they also have to make um, um, life very comfortable for the kid either. So a lot of times parents will go in, they'll try to wake up the kid and they'll say, you know, it's time to get up. And the kid will say, I don't want to go get up. And so they walk away and they leave them there. They come back in another 10 minutes. It's time to wake up. Get out of my room. Well, OK, I, they leave. So it's the parent's responsibility not to make it too comfortable for them either. When it's time to get up, open up the door, open up the drapes so that the light's in, turn on the radio to make it really loud um, so that it's not so comfortable just to be there. It shouldn't be a comfortable alternative to stay at home. Um, the school roll, roll early in the morning. It depends on the school. Um, most schools don't have things like truant officers anymore, but some, some may have some sort of ability to, to uh, participate at that um, part of the day. At school arrival, again, the child's responsibility is to um, use the skills that we're teaching them in therapy. Um, remember that things will only get better as they go. The parent's um, role is, again, to use that empathize and encourage. I know this is difficult as we approach the school, but it, you know, you're able to do it. Remind them of the agreements that they came up with and the rewards that they're going to get for accomplishing this. The school might allow a friend or a fellow student or a school staff member to meet the child at the car or at the front door um, so that um, they can help that transition into the school. Uh, they might also allow for graded um, hierarchy for attendance, like you know, day one, you can come in on period two. Day um, three, uh, you might come in for period one. Day five, you'll come in for homeroom. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as you uh, continue to get to school more, the child's responsibility is to um, have a graded reduction in the number of uh, visits to a nurse or times that they, they talk to the teacher looking for reassurance. Um, the parent's role is to continually continue to remove contact more and more, um, reducing uh, the amount of contact, the uh, willingness to take them home um, in the middle of the day. And the school's uh, role is to provide reasonable accommodation, adopt the empathize and encouragement approach, and to provide encouragement but not over accommodate. So this is one kind of um, uh, case that and we'll finish on, um, which is to give an example of how do we build these graded hierarchies such that we integrate the kid back into school, um, uh, minimizing as, as much the kind of tug of war and the uh, physical wrestling that needs to happen or, or that you know can happen um, and also make it something that the child can accomplish. Well, there's one recent case that we uh, saw of a girl 13 years old with social phobia and school refusal um, and where social situations really were the main trigger prompting her anxiety, attending school, hanging out, walking in the hallways, holding conversations, speaking to others, asserting stuff. And, um, these things triggered school refusal because she would have panic-like symptoms going to school, worrying about the starting of school, falling behind, doing poorly, being seen by fellow students and teachers as a failure. She seemed overwhelmed at the thought of going to school and freezing. She would cry, cling to her mom in the morning on the way to school. She could barely get to school, would go straight to the counselor's office, and even then had a hard time staying all day. Um, she would call the mom repeatedly until she picked her up. And at this point that we started seeing her, she um, had missed already 15 to 20 days um, due to anxiety. So what kind of uh, graded um, challenges would we put on her hierarchy? Well, we start very simple. Uh, the first step is just to regulate her morning routine. Even if she's not getting to school, um, we would say, we don't care if she gets to school in, um, this week. Get her up and get practice at getting up as if you were going to school. Set the alarm for 6 AM drag yourself to the bathroom, um, do your morning routine, go down and eat breakfast, get dressed, and then go back to bed. If that's what it takes, if you can't find yourself getting to school, do the morning routine, and then take the rest of the day off. That's worthy of uh, a reward um, when you're a child who hasn't been in um, school for half a year. Um, the next step, even if you're not getting into school, if the child refuses to get into school, it's gotta, you have to start practicing. 
practicing the act. So get your morning routine done, get in the car, drive to school, park in the parking lot for half an hour. Um, day one. Day two, increase that to an hour, to an hour and a half, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this, some of these things, you know, and, and you would adopt these things, um, adapt them basing on, you know, what the parent's availability is and what the resources are, et cetera, et cetera. But these are examples. Um, then, you know, again, if she can't get to school because she's worried about what people are going to think about her, go to school during off hours. Um, walk around the, the, um, the hallways. Uh, next, go to school for the morning, but don't go to class. Sit in the counselor's office. Um, if, after that, go to school for the morning, sit in the library, but now increase, get closer to the school um, act and, and do independent study. When you're able to, go to school for the whole day, sit in the library doing independent study. Again, this depends on a good collaborative effort with the school and their willingness to be able to allow that, to give that sort of leeway, as well as having the resources, because not all schools have someone where they could sit with the child in a, in a library, and a lot of schools have that sort of rule where a child can't be left alone. Um, you know, the next step might be going to selected uh, classes, returning to library as needed. And again, all of these um, uh, challenges are based on the primary uh, goal, uh, principle of it's better for the child to be in school, even if they're not in class, than to be at home. Um, then we might develop some other challenges to help them, uh, this, this particular child, get used to social interactions, even at school. Uh, property, talking to administrative personnel who might be safer talk to one student in the library hallway class, asking a student for homework, help assignments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where we're building up their comfort and ability to actually talk to other people and students in school, which are presumably their, their feared um, situation um, at school that are keeping them from wanting to go. So uh, with that, I want to leave you with some references. Uh, uh, both of these are very helpful and user-friendly uh, uh, books. One is a therapist guide for uh, the, the um, mental health professionals and the school professionals out there. And, and then there's also a parent guide, guide um, also by Chris Kearney, Getting Your Child to Say Yes to School, a guide for parents of youth with school refusal. So I think either of those might be good places for people to start. And I would like to open it up to questions. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we had a number of questions having to do with uh, teenagers yes and the anxiety does that situation change and evolve from young you know adolescents into teenagers um, so how do you deal with that whole teenager aspect? Right. <laughs> yeah it certainly does evolve I think that when we talk about um, anxiety in kids say children you know before um, 11 12 years old where you often see it uh, you describe it more as fear and you uh, see it mostly uh, displayed in um, physical symptoms, feelings of sickness, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, that's where a lot of that, they, they would claim sickness. And then with, with as you get to adolescence, obviously they can start putting more abstract thoughts on it. And so what you might see is, is a, a move towards that negative aspect that we described. And so they too would have physical symptoms. They might um, uh, beg out of school for sickness. You start hearing them use words like migraine headaches. Um, they feel, uh, you know, worn out. They start having, um, describing panic attacks, so more formal kind of, um, you know, acute um, uh, physiological symptoms that seem like when they get there, their eyes widen, they get short of breath, they start to hyperventilate. And so you might see uh, panic attacks. Um, and then you also, because um, adolescents have greater cognitive capacities, a lot more worry so they can um, identify and express um, the actual specific topics that um, they might be worrying about. So they say, oh, it's about school, or it's about fitting in, or it's about this, or about that. And what you want to be careful about is that you do want to acknowledge those things. You want to say, yes, those are all stressful things. Yes, that I'm, thank you for telling me that um, kids can be rough, or school is difficult. And at the same time, those are honest, but they're not necessarily true. When children, when adolescents are, ref, are refusing school, um, they often will identify triggers for them simply because adults keep asking them, what's wrong and why don't you want to go to school? But if you were to get them into an honest moment, uh, the real truth of the matter is that they just feel miserable. So when they get to school, they can't quite say why. They just start to have this negative response and they feel overwhelmed. 
And so what we try to do is explain to both parents and the kids and say, listen, you may have a lot of reasons for why you're not getting to school, but my guess is that you just feel overwhelmed and you can't explain why. Well, our job is to help you first come up with some you know, labels for that or help you kind of identify that that's just a feeling and it feels miserable. And then second, to learn how you can tolerate that, that upsetness because there are just some kids who are going to be more sensitive to situations than others. Their body will react to perceived threats out there. And what we want to do, and this is what the graded challenges are for, is that we're going to get you used to being able to handle that internal distress. And you're going to start to learn that, you know what, I'm not going to wake up every day and feel great. I can feel upset or miserable some days and still make it through the day. And if I get there to school, you never know what's going to happen. There could be good things that happen, even when I'm feeling upset, that would make the day worth going. And what we find that, on average, that is what ends up happening. Um, the world opens up, and we want to show that being involved in life is its is, is own reward. OK, great. Um, I have a question from um, someone whose son, along with having TS, has a background of trauma, developmental delay, and learning disability. Um, the parent is interested in knowing how this affects school refusable, refusal and if the treatment differs. Well, for sure. I mean, it certainly depends on the trauma, and it certainly depends on the type of learning disability. Um, you know, I think that you would want to make sure that you've done um, a comprehensive individual education plan um, in those those cases and make sure that you have the right support. So a lot of times, you know, if we're taking a, a child where anxiety is the main problem, we're, again, doing that empathizing but encouraging, pushing them forward. But we also want to know um, what are the bounds of what they can handle, too. So if a child really does have a reading problem, for example, you know, then it would be cruel to kind of send them to reading first and say, OK, you've got to go in and just sit in that class and participate fully. We want to make sure that we know what are the actual supports that they need and make sure that they're getting it so that we're kind of ruling out reasonable reasons for them to refuse school. So you want to make sure that you handle all those things so that they um, uh, do have those necessary accommodations, just like you know, if we um, had a child who did have authentic migraines, we would make sure that they go to a neurologist and, and make sure that they get assessed and say, hey, you know, what are, what, how far can we push this child? You know, um, and, and still, even if they do have legitimate migraines, that doesn't mean that every time they have a migraine, they shut down. But it, it does inform us to say, OK, we're going to come up with some nice ratings um, uh, thermometer and that, you know, there might be, when it's at a severity of a 9 or 10, OK, maybe that's a day you stay home. But if it's an 8, 7, or 6, maybe that's a day you can push through even when you didn't think that was possible. So same with learning disabilities. We want to know what's, what's real for them. And with trauma, you'd probably want to make sure that you address that at the same time. So if the trauma is related to school, I'm guessing, then you want to make sure that the child is still safe at the school and uh, that you've helped them address some of those concerns. But you know. Uh, okay. The answer is going to be a little inadequate because it's hard to tell from the you, question what are the. So you really need to cover the issues and make sure you've covered you, whatever the, the specific yes. medical issue might be or learning disability. Absolutely. And then have the plan for that and then Absolutely. go from there. Absolutely. Okay. Um, in your timeline, um, what are the, um, how is that measured? Um, was it measured in hours and days? Like, what is the expectation? Oh, minutes. Yeah, oh, minutes. minutes to hours, yeah. You okay, know, not days and months. No, but. no, 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 no. And that's that's the amazing thing is that, you know, that that um, um, that hill is uh, most classically used in something like a phobia. Like, if you have a fear of a spider um, and you see a spider in the corner of the room, you will have a spike of fear. But then within seconds, minutes, your system, even in the presence of that spider, your system can't tolerate being um, panicked for in, you know, in, uh, an indefinite amount of time. So your system will bring you back down. Now, for something like school refusal, when you get into school, you're going to be there. You're going to be upset. And you'll have things. You keep yourself 
ruminating on it, and that's a way that you can keep maintaining the distress. And so that's what we have to work with, which is that if you just allow yourself to pay attention to actually what's going on in that classroom, paying attention to what the teacher's saying, paying attention to you know what the kids are doing, your body will take its natural course. What kids tend to do is they send the, send they get the class, but then they just sit there and, and just get stuck in their head and say, oh, so yeah, I, I knew it wouldn't get any better. I knew it wouldn't get any better. That like therapist lied to me, and now I'm sitting here. Everyone's looking at me, and everyone's doing this. And what we have to do is we teach them, when you're actually in class, I want you to now start paying attention to all the things that are actually going around. And if you do that, your body will take its natural course. And within you know minutes to hour or so, that that anxiety starts to decrease. So they basically move on. Then. They move on. They yeah. get over the hump. Okay. Um, again, another question about the stress hill. Um, this comes from a speech language specialist, mm. and she's asking if it, if you thought it would be effective with a student who is a selective mute. Oh yeah, yeah. No, we see um, kids with selective mutism here all the time. It's the same thing. I mean, uh, uh, now selective mutism is a um, we're understanding a more and more complex uh, problem than we originally thought, and there's. Uh, I think that the, the best way to approach it is um, half uh, um, behavioral, like we do it, um, combined with some actual uh, 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 vocational and, and language um, therapy as well. Uh, because there are uh, kids with selective mutism do have some difficulties accessing words when they need to. Um, but for the, the anxiety component of it, so there is that legitimate difficulty accessing those words. But um, because of that, they've learned a lot of anxiety, like, oh, I won't be able to access those words, and so I get nervous, and so people are going to look at me, and then they're going to laugh, or they're going to think I'm stupid. And we use the same exact approach for those kids. Um, you know, working alongside a speech therapist, we would set up just the same challenges, have the child um, uh, meet uh, with a safe person, have hold a structured conversation, then have an unstructured conversation, then go approach someone here who's a novel, have them have a um, you know unstructured conversation. We do a lot of real life exposure based challenges to give them practice that okay, this is a safe environment where I can practice speaking and live with the consequences. And usually the consequences aren't as bad as what I'm fearing them to be. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, any suggestions? We have an elementary age student who seems to be having school refusal behaviors more at home than at school. They have trouble getting the child out of the house, but when she's at school, she's fine. Yeah. Yep. I think that's very instructive, right? So um, uh, what we would be identifying, and that, that is an example of the, uh, of the habituation curve uh, perfectly, that if they were, if he was just able to get over the hump of getting out of the house, then the distress goes down, right? So he's able to get there. So that's where you work with a combination of um, both rewards and consequences to encourage the kid to get into that over that hump. So if, if the parents drive them to school, then you know they set up a reward chart that um, you know you you uh, regulate the routine. You make sure, and that routine starts the night before, making sure they get to bed on time. Then they get up on time. Then you find what are the rewards that are going to matter to the child, really identifying personalized rewards that would be helpful. If you get just to the car, you get this. If you get in the car and you let me close the door, you get that. And and also inversely, like if, if you don't um, get to the car at all, then we're going to, you're not going to earn privileges. So we don't do punishments per se, but we, you know, do, the children often have privileges all around them that we could just not give them. Uh, so uh, for a kid in grade school, you know, not allowing them to have the Nintendo DS, that you know, you have the ability to earn this Nintendo DS if you get into the car. Um, if you don't get in the car, you don't get the Nintendo DS uh, the next day or today. Now, the great thing about those privileges is that they're um, renewable each day. You find something that you can renew so that they're not working out of debt every day. But you know, you have the ability to earn Nintendo DS. Each day, if you get in that car, you get one hour. If you get all the way to school without running out of the car, you get two hours. If you actually get into the school doors, you get three hours of Nintendo DS. But if you don't do any of those things, you don't get the Nintendo DS. So the kid can learn that one day. They're upset. They're angry. They didn't get it. So 
but they have an opportunity the very next day to get that Nintendo DS again. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I have a mom who says her son has been out of school since November mm -hmm. due to anxiety and Tourette. Yeah. How do we get the school to let him back and at the same time giving the school some strategies and a plan similar to what you know you've talked about? Here? Yeah, I think that it, you can approach. You would approach the school and you would um, show a new. Um, resolve uh, to get the kid back in school that, you know, our goal is now to return to school and we're committed to this. It will help if you get a, um, a therapist uh, to, to work alongside you so that they know that you're having a, a plan. But uh, you would you would approach it the same way that, that, that uh, you know, we laid out and that would you say, we have a new goal. We, maybe we were unsure about what was best previously, but we really want them to get back into school. So what can we work out? What would be acceptable to the school? And they say, well, you know, we're willing to work with you. And most schools are. You know, they're, they want to get their kids back into school. But you have to get here at least for half a day. Or you have to get here at least three days out of five. You have to do this. And so then you, you come up with what are the, the um, goals that you're both willing to live by. And then you um, lay out the plan like, okay, this is what we think we can do. So the first day, we can get them for half a day. The second day, we can get them for half a day. Um, day Monday of second of, of week two, we can get them in for a full day. And if you spell out those a graded plan, school uh, professionals may be willing to work with you along that um, thing. And then you would uh, take care of uh, your end by, uh, again, working out some sort of reward and consequence system to get um, uh, to help your your child along on your end. OK, thank you. Um, this mom says that the teenager keeps saying that she hates school. Mm -hmm. And you know, how do you get around that? I don't know. And that's, you know, this is, um, I feel for parents, actually. Um, you know, that uh, what's, what's difficult, I, I think we've really pinned ourselves down in, in that we've, we've almost become oversensitized to our children's feelings. And so that we almost expect that they should be happy all the time. And uh, the truth of the matter is that we have the ability to behave in ways that our feelings don't follow. Um, it's not necessary that a child go to school and like it. It's necessary for a child to go to school. Um, that's the priorities we set as a society. Um, school attendance is, is mandated by law. And we know that it's good for them. Um, so the fact that a child doesn't like to go to school isn't necessarily the issue. What we want to do is make sure that they get to school. And then what happens is that if they go, they often, and this goes to, for life, by the way. This isn't just school with kids. Um, this goes for anyone. We deal with this with depression all the time. That if you just go to life, you'll find that it's not as bad as you thought it was. and so. 80% of the battle is just getting there. Um, and so that's the message that we want to, to send. You know, the whole thing about hating school anyway is, uh, you know, it, it could be just the, the kid doesn't know how to articulate mm -hmm. really what the problem is. Sure. So that just is like, you know, I hate everything. Right. I, hate, well, and, I hate life. And, th and, th and that's yeah. where we, we just um, return to our cliche mantra of empathize and encourage. Because I think parents get wrapped up in that, too. They want to understand. They want to, if there's something really bothering them, they want to know. And the truth is, we might never get to something. And so the idea is that I know this is hard for you. I know it's upsetting. I know you don't like school. But I know that you can get there. Um, the truth of the matter is all of us have to do things that we don't like to do um, at, at one point or another. You know. Uh, not most people don't like getting up on that Monday morning and dragging themselves to work, um, but you know you do it because for all the reasons why you do it. Um, you know you get there, you're going to eventually enjoy it, or you just simply have to um, in order to learn earn a living. But if we send if we send them the message now that if you're not in the mood for it, you can't do it. We're, we're really doing a disservice to these kids. We're saying that when you don't feel like it, I guess that's the reason not to do it. And that's not, and that's going too far in the direction of attending to our feelings. Okay. Uh, is there ever a specific trigger for this behavior, rather than just the student feeling miserable, especially when it comes on suddenly? 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. And those are the things you want to rule out as well. So, so most of this talk was for those um, kids and parents and school professionals who, who are kind of like left, have gone through all that effort, um, have checked into like seeing if there's an identifiable problem and can't find anything and the kid just doesn't want to go to school. If there is an actual identifiable problem with bullying or if the kid is suddenly having trouble with um, you know, a certain class or a teacher, uh, those are relatively easier to solve because if you can identify something like that, then you just use you know, basic problem solving and, and uh, try to address it that way. But um, those problems don't tend to lead to chronic school refusal. Those tend to lead to temporary school refusal and they, the child is eventually able to identify the problem, and then the parent, you know, can go to school and advocate and, and try to get it fixed. Um, but what we're talking about are those undefined, diffused um, school refusal problems. Okay, I have a, a, a lengthy question here, and I'm I'm not sure that we have enough time for it, so I may just chunk out a little bit of it. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, I have a question about. Um, about a parent of from a parent of a teenager, um, that there you know this whole fear of school escalates to anger, mm -hmm. leads to threats of hurting someone because yeah. they're going to annoy me, uh, come and get me, or I'll go to jail. Thinks that smoking pot is better than medication. Yeah. So there's a whole a whole assortment of of things going on here, and it and it may be that this there isn't enough time in this. Uh, in what we have left to even tackle that one. I think maybe we'll uh, make sure this ends up on the chat board. Sure. And you could um, spend a little bit more time on it. Sure. How's that? That's fine. And, and I think that even on a chat board, I, I don't want to also sound glib and say that all these um, problems are easy to solve. Um, and that uh, for a complex case like that, and for all these cases, you really want to do an individual assessment understand an individual functional analysis, what's really maintaining these problems. So in that particular case, it may be a combination of the kid really does want, like, get, like a combination of tangible rewards. They get something out of missing school. They get to hang out with other delinquent friends or whatever, um, and a combination of negative affect um, and all that. So you want to make sure that you do a thorough assessment um, and that someone's working with you to really help you identify those um, the issues, even if they're not due to a specific trigger. Um, because uh, you know anything that I say right now will, will sound glib, um, and so it's, it's hard to um, to just kind of solve a single case problem here on the phone or yeah. even over the comments Understood. line. Understood. Um, so as long as you've kind of mentioned that additional assessment, I want to bring up a question, and actually it showed up a couple of times. Uh, if you would just explain a little bit about this, your center. Um, what the we have a question about the average cost of services. I'm assuming that's probably a sliding scale of some mm -hmm. kind. If you know yeah, we case. do a sliding scale. Um, you know, as you mentioned at the beginning, um, our clinic is uh, focused on a training uh, for training purposes. Uh, so we train doctoral students um, in psychology and also for research because um, all the families who um, come to our clinic uh, participate in um, research, which really means filling out a number of questionnaires and and interviews uh, so that we know we can evaluate whether what we're doing is helpful or not. And um, and in exchange for that, we do try to keep our, our um, fees very affordable. They're on a sliding scale from like 12 to $40 a session. Um, we don't uh, charge for the initial intake um, uh, either uh, because we, we do um, uh, try to, to make sure that uh, families who can come in um, are able to uh, and so that we can see if we're the appropriate place. And if not, we will refer out to the most appropriate, um, you know, other place. And we do have other, um, you know, referral sources that we can um, hook families up with. Okay. Um, I'm going to tackle one more question. I think we've almost come to the end. And if um, anyone has to leave, we're about at our hour. So if anyone uh, has to leave uh, and your uh, survey questionnaire pops up, I hope you'll just take a minute to um, I have a question about um, a reward program for a 16-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, we've talked about you know rewards in terms of Nintendo, and, and yeah. maybe that's appropriate cell phones for a are little. The best. You know, oh, I actually I actually like working with adolescents because the cell phone seems to be like the most salient. Um, reward to anybody at any age ever. Um, so there's there's no better. 
um, reward than a cell phone for a teenager. So if they have that, um, and if you haven't given your child a cell phone, uh, kudos to you, and <laughs> yeah, that's even better. But if they have it like 85% of the kids out there, um, that's a great renewable reward. So you know your ability to have this cell phone, it depends on your getting to school, um, and, um, and, and you can earn a number of hours with that as, as you go. And that's something that parents have complete control over. Um, I've yet to be convinced that there's any uh, uh, need uh, for a teenager has to have a cell phone um, as a case of an emergency. If they're going to school, they'll have um, you know plenty of phones around there. Uh, so that's something that's easy to take away, and it's easy as uh, something that's easy to give. Um, but you know, so that that's uh, one thing. But also, pri um, you know, privilege. We try not to tie um, you know too many social things uh, to uh, uh, their behaviors because we do want to encourage that. But in the case of school refusal, it's a good idea because you know a child shouldn't be going and hanging out at the movies on Friday night um, with their friends um, if they can't get to school and. Uh, strangely enough, the, these are kids who often have that dichotomy. They won't go to school, but you know they're willing to go out with their friends, and we want to encourage that. But uh, there are certain privileges you have to earn, and, and that's among them. Um, but it can be also as as, um, as small as things as as just um, you know power over the TV, which um, TV shows that the family gets to watch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, just to reinforce uh, one of my comments about making the environment aversive, if the child can't get to school, um, you should also plan to make sure that the home's not a rewarding environment if they're staying at home. So um, you know, take the power cords out of the TVs and the computers so that um, what they're able to do is to sit there and study. Um, it shouldn't be a very rich, entertaining environment that you leave your kid at home in. OK. Doctors, thank you very much. That is the last question for tonight. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining us, our webinar on school refusal. There is an exit survey which should show on your screen as you exit. Please fill out the evaluation on the exit survey. This discussion, the discussion board will be open tomorrow and available for, it's actually open now, and available for the next seven days the NJ, on the NJCTS website for any questions not covered in tonight's presentation. That website is www.njcts.org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to the site. Our next presentation, TS and Associated Daytime and Sleep Behaviors, Evaluation and Treatment Options, is going to be presented by Dr. Michael Seifert and is scheduled for April 28, 2010. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good